Thank you. Um, yeah, so this talk is basically on my PhD. Um, I'm currently a PhD student in Durham. Um, and this is sort of like the early stages, the process. So I'm in the second year of my PhD. Um, so I just talked to you about like the kind of approach I'm taking with my research, where I wanted to go basically. Um, so I'll start with a kind of overview about Paleolithic cave art, um, why I'm doing this research and why I'm taking a cognitive approach to it. Um, talk about uh, previous approaches that takes, um, similarly take a, a cognitive slant um, on cave art. And then talk about my own research and how I'm bringing in a different um, approach that integrates uh, cognition and psychology in an interesting way, I think, or I hope you think. Um, and then conclude with a little bit of a twist. Um, you'll find out later. Um, so basically this is uh, kind of up until recently, broadly the picture of um, Paleolithic cave art, um, where it's, we um, used to believe that it was this uh, behavior restricted to anatomically modern humans. And it was this, um, indicative of a flourish of creativity um, in anatomically modern humans and then this place does a superior somehow in our cognition. Um, but over recent years this has been um, challenged. Oh and um, sorry and this has um, been approached by trying to explain away Paleolithic art using a single explanation um, that kind of focuses on the aesthetics of the art rather than trying to understand anything um, <coughs> further than that. But this has been challenged recently um, by new dates um, using uranium thorium um, dating. So um, Pike et al back in 2012 um, published a paper that seemed to push back um, our knowledge of uh, the oldest art in Europe and tentatively suggested that this might have been produced by Neanderthals with um, a date around kind of 40,000 years old. Um, and then in 2014, um, we had another oldest art date coming out from Indonesia that seemed to suggest that figurative art particularly um, is emerging kind of quite early on so around 36,000 years old. And then of course, last year we got um, dates that confirmed that we have Neanderthals producing art um, in Northern Spain at least, um, which seems to be a kind of earlier phase of non-figurative art and embodied art. So this kind of serves to demonstrate that this single explanation of Paleolithic arts that tries to explain it away with one um, kind of grand narrative um, just doesn't work anymore and we need to come up with new ways to challenge this. Um, we know, now know that art is very diverse across the Paleolithic, it's quite extensive, um, it spans across different hominins um, and spans like at least 40,000 years um, in time, so we can't just explain it away with one explanation. So bearing that all in mind, this is where my PhD kind of sits. Um, and it's trying to move away from this um, grand narrative approach or umbrella theory, um, as I coined the term, um, and instead try and focus on more grounded approaches that look at Paleolithic art um, in detail from specific sites and place emphasis on the making of the art um, as a way to access potentially its meaning. So the aim of my PhD is to understand the role of the visual cognitive system in determining the theme, style and placement of figurative depictions. And I'm focusing this on um, the Monte Castillo sites that are in northern Spain that are around this kind of oddly shaped pyramid mountain um, situated in a very beautiful area of Cantabria. But of course, I'm not the first person to take a cognitive approach to Paleolithic arts. Um, and actually, this is quite um, has a long history of being used in um, Upper Paleolithic art research. And arguably it was Lewis Williams who first tried to take a, a psychological slant um, on approaches to Paleolithic art. And some of you might be familiar with this idea of the three stages of altered consciousness model um, that tries to argue that um, in a, a cave environment, 
or um, in a trance state. People go through these stages of um, altered consciousness that then informs the depictions that are being produced. And there are many issues with this um, that I don't have the time to get into now. Um, but primarily, it just oversimplifies psychological phenomena. Um, it kind of misuses the ethnographic record as a, a basis for coming up with this three stages of alter consciousness model. And um, kind of crucially, it tries to explain all Paleolithic cave art as being produced by people going into trances and then experiencing this psychological phenomena and then producing um, art that's, that replicates the phenomena they're seeing. And this, this is clearly quite problematic. Uh, in contrast, Derek Hodgson um, kind of applies psychology in a more appropriate way. So Derek Hodgson is, um, I think, by training, a psychologist. So he's coming into this from that background of psychology. Um, and he argues that um, instead of this kind of trance altered states of consciousness, people are just experience, uh, experiencing what he calls hyper imagery which is like an extended form of pareidolia. So, you know, um, seeing kind of faces in objects or um, shapes in the clouds, uh, that's pareidolia. Um, and I think for me, what's important is that he, he doesn't see this as something that's just happening in the mind. Instead, he considers the effect of the environment on giving um, cues <coughs> and stimuli to um, informing the, the depictions that are being produced. So he argues that within a cave environment, um, you have this kind of great, uh, graduating scale of uh, phenomena that's experienced. So you go from your normal experience um, in a, a normal stimuli environment, right through to um, an abnormal mental state where um, the increasing ambiguity of visual stimuli kind of sends the brain into overdrive and it's trying to fill in pieces that it can't see. And that causes you to see um, images which aren't there, essentially. And I'm sure all of us has probably experienced this in the dark where you mistake a coat or something for an object or a person. Um, it's basically that that applied to cave art. Um, naturally, it's not a perfect model and primarily um, Although it's compelling, the issues with this is it's not yet been tested against the archaeological record. Uh, Hodgson kind of pulls out a few examples, for example, these um, mammoths in Rupinyak Cave and sort of suggests that the, the flint nodules here um, are giving visual stimuli um, that are then shaping the, the depiction of the mammoths. But this hasn't been tested in any sort of grounded way, it's just kind of hypothesizing over. So um, this is kind of where my research is jumping off. Um, thank you. Uh, where I'm taking this, this idea, this concept of experiencing visual phenomena in um, caves and trying to test it against the archaeological record, but with a new theoretical framework um, that places emphasis on, on the process of making the art. So. This, I'm going to quickly rush through this, and I apologise, please ask me questions um, after. So, um, my theoretical approach is kind of drawing on both observations in um, ethnography and how um, contemporary small-scale societies create art, and also um, relational theory. Um, and primarily, like, a big issue in current cave art research is that we assume that art is this embellished aspect of society. Um, we're creating it for its aesthetic form alone, and then it's kind of sold on and it's commodified. Um, and using kind of non-Western perspectives and also um, theories such as Deleuze and Guattari that kind of react against this capitalist conception of the world, I'm trying to reconceive art in a different light and trying to consider it in terms of its um, embedded nature within societies. So, for example, um, I'm looking at figurative art, and a crucial part of that, therefore, is the dependency on animals and how people are relating to animals and how that might inform their own conception and mental state about animals. And that, that's kind of intrinsic to the art, in my opinion. Um, and this figure here is just emphasising that um, 
the theoretical discourse moves from talking about um, grand scale networks and uh, shifting down to the specific relations in sort of Hodder's entanglements uh, theory and assemblage theory. Sorry, I'm rushing through this. Um, so I'm kind of trying to draw this all in into um, a theoretical framework that emphasizes um, this process of making the art. And rather than taking a traditional Chan operator approach, where it's kind of a series of prescribed stages that one might go through to create art, um, I want to instead try and consider this as a kind of reflexive, um, ongoing cyclical process that's happening, where both um, the mind and uh, the materials are kind of shaping and informing one another, um, and these are all kind of in being placed within this broader social cultural context, which is where the relational theory um, kind of draws in there. So I'm emphasizing the, the kind of psychology of this as a way to kind of look into the, into the mind of the artist and understand how this process is shaping um, both the mind and how the mind is then informing the arts. I hope this is making sense. Um, but I really want to try and test this against the archaeological record. So um, how do I ground all of this theory into um, a, a coherent model and approach for understanding Paleolithic art? Uh, so I'll just go through my kind of workflow at the moment um, and then wrap up. Yeah, because <laughs> I've got a minute left. So um, basically, I'm making 3D models using photogrammetry of cave art in northern Spain. So um, as you can appreciate, it's quite difficult to do because it's absolutely pitch black in these caves. But it then produces these quite beautiful um, models of the cave art panels that can then be manipulated to remove the art, like so. Um, I'm then trying to place this into uh, virtual reality to use for psychology experiments. So the idea is we can replicate the lighting conditions um, of caves in the Paleolithic, so make it pitch black and with people only having a small flickering light source that um, kind of imitates the, the kind of light that would have been available to people in the Paleolithic. Um, and then using this environment within um, psychology experiments where people are then immersed within this a uh, virtual reality environment um, where they're presented with a cave wall that has the art removed um, and they're just asked to see, uh, we ask them what they're seeing in the cave wall um, and to kind of mitigate against these being probably um, kind of Western <laughs> students. Um, we're going to prime them with Pleistocene animals beforehand and make it increasingly more difficult for them to identify the features of the animals and that gets them into this mindset where they're trying to pick out features of animals which is likely what paleolithic hunters would have had to do frequently and then put them in this environment and then ask them what they're seeing in the natural features um, and this is trying to move towards this way where we can test hypotheses about um, cognition in paleolithic art <coughs> against the archaeological record so to conclude very quickly, I'm sorry, I'm running over time. Um, I just thought we'd run through this and see whether it works or yeah, have a bit of a play and a bit of fun with this. So I'm going to show you a clip of a bison. And I want you to focus on the kind of key features of the bison as it walks through. Very quickly. Quite a beautiful clip, I think. Okay, and then I will show you um, a cave art panel that has had the art removed, and I just want you to try and see whether you're seeing any kind of animals within this. So this is the virtual reality environment I was talking about. It's a bit um, jolty because I'm trying to do it on a PC rather than within a headset. Mm. 
And I'm not sure quite how well this is showing up on the screen. Anyone seeing anything yet? No, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> okay, great. And then I will show you what this panel looks like with the art on. And I'll point out here um, where they're using the natural features. So I don't know if anyone picked out in that um, clip of the art. So here we have a little, this is quite difficult to see, but we have a little bison here. Um, its horns are using um, natural cracks in the cable. And then hopefully this will pan right soon. <laughs> <laughs> should have done this quicker when I was filming it. <laughs> yeah, so we have another, a larger bison here. Um, this is a natural crack that's forming its back. And then we have a painted leg under here. This is another, another natural crack sort of underneath that's been extended with paint. And then you can sort of see this almost weird geometric head, but in the clip of the bison you can appreciate that bison sometimes look a little bit geometric um, in their shape. That's also using kind of the natural rock here to bring that out. Yeah. And I'll finish there. So thank you. Um, Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I ran over and if you have any questions then feel free to contact me.